Hello and welcome back to Philosophy Over Tea, the podcast where you join me on my journey through philosophy. Hosted by myself, Sahir, Philosophy Over Tea explores various major philosophical ideas through major philosophers, essential texts, as well as major technologies along the way. In today's episode, we look at a moral philosophy known as utilitarianism. We'll explore what it is, how it came about, as well as some interesting case studies and arguments for and against it. Welcome to Philosophy Over Tea. So what is utilitarianism? Well, utilitarianism is a moral philosophy developed in the 18th century by philosopher Jeremy Bentham. It is a type of consequentialist moral reasoning. Consequentialist moral reasonings essentially state that the morality of an action depends solely on its consequences. One of the most prominent kinds of consequentialist theories is the one we'll be discussing today, utilitarianism. Utilitarianism essentially states that the right, just thing to do is to maximize utility. What is utility? Well, utility is essentially the balance of pleasure over pain. To put it into simpler terms, this theory essentially aims to get the most amount of pleasure for the most number of people. Now, on the surface, this does seem like a pretty solid thing, pretty solid theory. In society, we want to maximize the amount of pleasure for people. We want most people to have the most enjoyable experience they can. And this does make sense. If we have a group of 100 people and say 99 of them want one thing and one person wants something else, it would obviously make sense to go with what the 99% want. That is as well the basis of democracy. However, there are issues with this theory. For those of you who've seen shows such as The Good Place, one issue pointed out in that show is that utilitarianism can be used to justify any bad action. You can torture one person to save, say, a hundred, because that is technically the moral thing to do according to utilitarianism. An interesting case of this is the story of the ones who walk away from Omalas. So in this story, there is a town known as Omalas, and it is essentially a utopia. This is the town in which there are no issues. Everyone just is always really happy in this town from birth until as long as they live there. However, when people reach a certain age, when they enter adulthood, they are brought into a special room that no one can access before then. When they go inside, they see a small child suffering. And they are told that the reason that this town is a utopia is because of that child's suffering. That child suffers enough for the rest of the town to prosper. And then they are given the choice to leave or finish out their days here. And most of them decide to leave. But why is that? If we stick to a strictly utilitarian perspective, it makes sense. We should let the one child suffer in order to let the thousands of people in that town live happily. So why do people decide to leave Omalas? Well, there's been a lot of debate around this, a lot of discussion around this. And one of the things that comes up is that, well, it can't be right to let one person suffer just for so many others. This brings out one of the issues with utilitarianism, in that it disregards basic individual rights. Another example of this is the Romans, when they had colosseums in which they would torture Christians. They'd throw in a Christian with some wild rabbit animal, and let that animal torture and chase the Christian around. Now, all the others, the Romans watching that one person get tortured, they loved it. They enjoyed the spectacle. So according to utilitarianism, it must be fine to just let that happen. But again, it doesn't account for that one individual's rights. It doesn't take into account their rights. Now, looking at these examples, it seems clear that consequentialism and utilitarianism specifically doesn't seem to be the answer. So, well, what else can be? Well, there's another branch of 
moral reasoning, which is known as categorical moral reasoning. This essentially believes that there are certain things, there is a category of things that define something's morality. Essentially, that morality is in certain morals and certain rights. And one of the biggest proponents of this theory is Immanuel Kant. And I'm planning to explore this concept a bit later on. Returning to utilitarianism, however, let's take a look at a really important idea that's present in moral philosophy. And this problem is known as the trolley problem. Now, many of you might have heard of the trolley problem. It's a pretty common thing to hear about. And the premise of it goes as follows. Suppose you are driving a trolley. It's going down the tracks, and you notice that in front of you, there are five people. There are five construction workers working on the track. And as you go forward, you know that if the trolley hits them, they will all die. And as you trundle towards them at full speed, you notice that there is another track off to the side. Inside your trolley, you have a lever that once you pull it, it will divert you off to that track, but it will kill that one construction worker. Do you pull the lever or not? Now, initially, many people would say that it's better to kill that one worker rather than five. Well, why? It's because people argue that it can't be moral to kill five when you can just kill one and limit the amount of suffering there is. Now, consider this case, but slightly different. Suppose that that one person on that other track is your best friend. Now do you pull that lever? Now this question becomes much harder because it's more personal. You're either going to kill someone who's your best friend or five complete strangers. Now even in this case, a lot of people still choose to pull the lever and kill the one with the same reasoning. Yes, it's going to cause more hurt to myself, but I'm still saving five people rather than killing them to favor one. Now consider another version of this. Say the trolley is going along, but this time you're not inside the trolley. You're standing on a bridge that's above, and there's a fat man on that bridge with you. Now you see the trolley coming, and you know it's going to hit those five construction workers up ahead. But what you can do is you can push that man down, he'll die, but those five construction workers won't. Now when this question is asked, to a room full of people, a lot more of them say that just let the five die rather than pushing that one person. Well, why is that? If you look at this from a utilitarian perspective, it's exactly the same as the previous situation. It's either you kill one or you kill five. So why do so many people switch their perspectives and decide to kill the five this time? A lot of the reason behind this, it seems, is because people seem to think that it's more you're more responsible when you push the person rather than simply change your lane. And that makes sense, but from a utilitarian perspective, it still should be morally correct to kill the one person rather than let those five die. Now let's take a look at another perspective, another version of this problem. Let's say that you are a doctor. You are a doctor and six patients come in. Let's say that five of those patients have very minor injuries from a trolley explosion that happened one track over. And let's say one person, the sixth one, has really, really severe injuries because a trolley just plowed right into him. Would it be morally right to save the five with minor injuries and in that time let the one with major injuries die? Or would you rather save the one who has the severe injuries, but in that time, all the five with minor injuries will die. In this case, a lot of people would say that just let the one with major injuries die and save the five with minor injuries. Seems to make sense, right? Why devote so much time to one patient who is so close to dying and let five who are just minorly injured die? But let's look at a different version of this doctor situation. Suppose that you have five patients who came in. Each of them are going to die unless they get the organs they need. Suppose one needs a lung, one needs a heart, one needs a kidney, one needs an eye, and one needs 
a stomach or something. This is an ideal situation, so I don't know if these would actually be life-threatening situations, but let's consider that they are. And now suppose that in the room next door, you have a perfectly healthy guy who just came in for a checkup. He just came in for a simple checkup. He's taking a nap next door. You could just dash over, cut him open, take his organs, and come back and save these five. Would you do it? Well, a lot of people say that no, they wouldn't do it this time. Why? Again, the same as before. It seems like you are more personally, more morally responsible when you are going to literally kill that one person when he was in no way involved in this as well. So you see the dilemma that many moral theories have and things that they need to answer. In each of these cases, it's the same result. You kill one to save five. In the trolley version part two with the fat man, you kill one to save five. In both the doctor problems, you kill one to save five. So why do these answers change so much? There's been a lot of discussion and discourse on why that is, and obviously we haven't come to an answer yet, considering that this debate is still going on thousands of years after it began. Well, utilitarianism, more like 300 years-ish ago. Now let's take a look at another case, but this time one that is a real case. A little bit of a warning ahead, this case does mention a bit of cannibalism, but no detail at all. So this is a case of Queen versus Dudley and Stevens. I will leave a longer link in the description of this podcast to where you can read the whole case if you wish. So what happened here was there were four sailors, right? They went on a voyage. One of them was a 17-year-old boy, and the other three were seasoned sailors. Now they go out, and what happens is one day during a storm, their entire ship capsizes. And all that's left is them four on a little sailboat with some canned food and no water. That's all. Now, they're there for about 19 days, after which the 17-year-old is extremely ill because he drank seawater, despite being told not to drink seawater because it will make him ill. Now, 17 days, they've run out of all the food, and there's one of them about to die. And they don't know how long they're going to be stuck there for. And so what they decide to do is one of them says, let's just do a lottery, pick some name, pick one name out and see who dies to save everyone else. Now, obviously, one of them disagrees with this. He's like, no, I'm not going to do this either because of a utilitarian perspective, because, well, there's one kid who's already about to die, or maybe just because he didn't want to be eaten by everyone else. Instead, he says that, well, there's this kid here who's already dying, so we might as well just get it over with, kill him, and use him as food. And, well, that's exactly what they decide to do. One of them goes up to him, just whispers a prayer into his ear while he's asleep, and stabs him with a pen knife. Now, about six or seven days from then, they're rescued, but as soon as they land back on shore, they are immediately put on trial for murder. Now imagine you're in the jury there. What even do you say for this? Would you say that they're guilty of murder? They should be charged and sent to prison? Or are they not guilty because, well, they acted out of necessity? Many would argue that they are guilty because humans shouldn't have the power to take lives and that murder is murder. But isn't this something that was done out of necessity? Couldn't there be a moral side to murder? A lot of people also argued this perspective, that they weren't guilty because they acted out of necessity. In the end, these two were charged with murder, and it set a precedent in law that necessity is not a good defense against murder. It is still considered murder and you will be charged with it. But what does this case show us? Well, it shows us often that utilitarianism is, it doesn't exactly work always. Another objection to the utilitarianism case is that it places all of our pleasures on par with each other. It doesn't value certain things over other things. Now, while this may seem good at a base level that like, okay, everyone should be equal, everything we do should be equal, it doesn't make sense when you look at it from that Roman and the Christian case that was mentioned earlier. 
if utilitarianism, at least the original utilitarianism, is correct, then those Romans enjoying the punishment of the Christian is just as valuable as, say, someone reading poetry or someone being a scholar and learning about the world. Now, it may seem obvious to us that those things are not on par, but at the base level, the Bentham's utilitarianism perspective was that all of these are at the same level. Now, looking at it from that perspective, let's say that you are a rat who lives forever, and you only experience the pleasure that a rat does. Now, would you rather be a rat that experiences just those animalistic pleasures forever, or would you rather be a human that can experience sort of higher level pleasures, such as reading and understanding the world around us? Many people would say that they would still rather be the human, even though at some point, according to Bentham's utilitarianism perspective, that rat's life will become better and should be valued higher than the human's. This is another serious issue with Bentham's utilitarianism, which is why another later philosopher, uh, John Stuart Mill, came up with this idea that pleasure, pleasures should be ranked in some way. There should be higher level and lower level pleasures. Now these higher level pleasures will always be more valued than lower level pleasures. So reading Shakespeare, for example, will always be better than watching The Simpsons and just drinking all night. But well, what are these higher and lower order pleasures? And who decides which one is a higher pleasure, which one is a lower pleasure? I mean, it does seem like a pretty subjective thing. Like maybe for me, reading is a higher order pleasure. For someone else, maybe playing a video game on the weekend is a higher order pleasure. It seems very subjective. But Mill wrote in his uh, works, specifically his book known as Utilitarianism, he wrote that it is necessary to cultivate and educate someone in order to attain these higher order perspectives. And once someone does have ample education, they will not just see, but they will also prefer the higher order perspective, the higher order pleasure over the lower order ones. He believes that it was necessary to cultivate and educate someone before they could understand it though. So not everyone at first will see it, which is why the base level utilitarianism, the one proposed by Bentham, doesn't just fit society on its own. In fact, in some cases, it actually becomes a detriment to society, specifically because of the issues we mentioned earlier and this one as well. So where do we go from here? Well, an interesting thing I think to look at that I think I'm going to look into more would be how the government works with these moral philosophies and utilitarianism in particular. Is it someone's right to have their own individual perspective, their own individual pleasures and be able to act on them? Or should someone give up their rights to the government and allow the government to decide who should have the most amount of pleasure? Is it up to the government to maximize the pleasure in all of society? Maybe take away resources from one area to provide for another? There's a lot of interesting ways to go with utilitarianism, and I'm hoping to explore this further in later episodes as well. Well, this brings us to the end of the episode. I hope you all enjoyed, and I will see you all in the next one. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.